Welcome to the Under One Roof Landlord and Letting Agent webinar series, made possible through the generous funding of the Safe Deposit Scotland Charitable Trust. The question and answer session will start momentarily. For those who are joining us for the first time, Under One Roof is a free, independent service that supports landlords, letting agents, owner-occupiers, factors, local authority housing officers, and others throughout the sector with issues around owning and maintaining a tenement flat in Scotland. Last year, through funding from Safe Deposit Scotland Charitable Trust, the Scottish Government, and local authorities throughout Scotland, we attained charity status, which has enabled us to hire a full-time staff dedicated to working with landlords and owner-occupiers of tenement flats and those that support them. In the coming months and years, Under One Roof will be increasing the information available on our website, our Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram accounts, and through our monthly newsletter. We encourage you to share information we send out with those in your building or in your sector to help us improve the quality of tenement flats in Scotland. Today's question and answer webinar will last one hour with a short comfort break around the halfway mark. We encourage you to post your questions and comments into the chat box at the bottom of your screen. When asking a question, please provide your first name and a brief description of the issue you'd like to raise. If you'd like to appear on screen and ask your question directly, rather than have us read it out, please let us know. If we run out of time before your question is answered, please drop us an email with your question or join us for the next question and answer session. Thanks for joining us. Let's begin. Hi, everyone. Uh, sorry, we just cut out there just a little bit too early, but uh, welcome to the uh, Under One Roof uh, question and answer, uh, Ask the Tenement Experts question and answer session for landlords and letting agents. I'm Mike Efron. I, um, as the introduction said, I'm the Chief Executive of Under One Roof Scotland, and we are joined today by Annie Flynn. Uh, Hi, hello, Annie. Hi, there, everyone. Pleased to be uh, here again. <laughs> and John Gilbert, who's just coming in. Hi, John. How are you? Uh, Annie, and, Annie and John are resident tenement experts, authors of the Tenement Handbook, and uh, like we've done with previous uh, webinars, they will be here to uh, help answer uh, any questions that you have, um, provide information, um, and also um, uh, hopefully initiate a little bit of discussion as well um, with um, questions that you might have as a, as a landlord. So, um, well, without further ado, I think what we'll do is we'll just get started. And I wanted to first start off with a question that was sent to us from uh, Ian. And this is sort of a question that I think that the audience might be able to help out with um, by putting in uh, information into uh, the chat space. As you noticed in your webinar software there, uh, you've got the uh, chat room. It's under public. And uh, there's also a one that says Q&A. Uh, Q&A would be where you put your questions. You can take a look at the questions that have been submitted to us already. Um, and we'll get to those over the course of the webinar. Um, and also, but in the chat room, uh, be an opportunity to share any information and guidance that you might have. Um, and I think what we'll do is we'll first start off with one of those. And this is uh, from Ian who says, I am a new private landlord, but don't have an agent in place for the property. Now, Ian has a, a number of questions, some of which are not something probably that we are, are best placed to, to, to answer, but I think the people that are taking part in this webinar would be able to do so. Um, so let me go through them one by one. Uh, one is, are there guidelines to acceptable landlord timeframes to dealing with tenant queries, such as a power, temporary power outage in the property? Another question is, what if in practice we can't get a plumber or an electrician to attend a property in the middle of the night. Uh, another one is, is there an advised process for when the landlord is going to be uncontactable, for example, on holiday? And do we leave emergency plumber and electrician numbers with the tenants or do we need to arrange some to act as a temporary landlord? So uh, Jazz, who is in the background, she's uh, uh, supporting us as our communications officer today. She'll pop those into uh, the chat room. Um, and if people could, uh, over the course of the, the webinar today, see what they can do to, to help Ian out with those kinds of questions. Um, and apologies, I have my cat has just joined us for the webinar as well. Uh, right. Why don't we first get to the one question uh, for, and I believe this one is probably best for Annie, but John, pop in there if you like. Uh, it's from Michael. And he says, our neighbors left on a long-term trip to visit family and ignored our messages about fixing a joint block drain. We went ahead with the repair as we were worried about damage. They returned and said that we, and said they felt that we messaged them too aggressively and refused to pay for the repair. 
Uh, we believe we were patient and very polite and think that they are claiming that we felt we were too aggressive to avoid pain. Uh, and we were quite close neighbors before all of this. Uh, so this is very unfortunate. So um, they have asked, what, uh, where do we start with receiving repa uh, payment for that repair? Well, I think this is one of these the classic kind of things. You know, I th let's just try and imagine what's happened here. But people have gone away on holiday. They've been, you know, you, you don't know what they've invested in this holiday, do you? About seeing family. We've all been stuck, you know, with COVID, not being able to see folk. And people are sometimes not kind of in their normal frame of mind with things. You just don't know what was being received at the other end. Maybe they were having a lot of problems with family. Um, and you just don't know, and you know, you just can't tell what's been happening behind the scenes to make them think that you were kind of being aggressive about it. But I think the situation here is one way, you know, like in all these cases, it's probably actually much better to see if you can get on with your neighbors and deal with things in a kind of mediative kind of way before you start crashing in on the kind of legal procedures of, of taking people to court, which of course you could do here. I mean, there is nothing anywhere in the Tenements Act that says that you being aggressive is a, is a reason for not paying for repairs. In fact, possibly the reason they're not paying for repairs is that they've spent all their cash on that holiday. Um, you know, you just don't know what's happening. But what we do advise people to do here is actually read our, our article on having difficult conversations. Use that as your starting point. And also, we did a very good webinar last year where we had a solicitor and um, Graham Boyack from the Scottish Mediation Service talking about how to deal with your neighbours in situations where they just won't pay up for repairs. And, and, and there's some good starters for you in, in both of these places. So I think the first thing to do is read through that article. I know Jazz will put up a link to it and she'll also put up a link to that particular webinar as well. Have a listen and read through those and then, you know, summon up your courage, summon up your patience again, ring up your neighbours and say, look, we used to get on really well. Could we go out for a coffee and have a chat about this situation and see what we can do? And just try and put yourself in, in their position for the moment. Just try and understand what, what they were going through and then patiently explain your position. And say, look, you know, we were worried about the property. You know, we didn't want anyone to have to pay more than they had to and just see if you can coax them into doing it. And if they totally block you, if they're totally obnoxious, then maybe you do have to take them to court. But, you know, the best thing to do is just start off trying to listen to their point of view in a neutral kind of place and just see if you can start to, to resolve this issue on that kind of mutual basis, first of all, because, you know, it's much easier to carry out repairs in a tenement where everyone gets on, as you know, and that the situation you should try and achieve. Yeah. That seems like that seems like good advice, Annie. Um, there certainly is going to be a lot more going to have a lot more success, not only just getting the money, but also remembering that you're going to have to be living with, you know, with these people as neighbors in the future. So trying to figure out a way to make it to make it work. And if it is a money issue and, you know, treading softly on that, too, nobody wants to be embarrassed. And so the reality is, is they just don't have the money. So figuring out a way to to lightly sort of talk around that issue. And we've got some uh, stuff on the website as well about sort of if people are looking for for ways to find alternative funding um, uh, that people can can look at as well. And is there is there one is there a couple of those things that you can just briefly talk about as far as what options people have? In terms of financing, mm. um, it de really depends what the kind of the cost is in terms of, of this. I mean, if you're talking about many thousands of pounds, um, always the, the first source of finance, if you don't have it to hand, is to try and extend your existing mortgage. Um, you know, that's always going to be the cheapest way of doing things. Um, after that, you're getting into other kinds of loans. Um, which could be a, a bank loan or, or even credit union loans if people are, are, are members of a, a, a credit union. Um, but, you know, really, if you don't have the cash to hand, then you often are talking about loans. Um, in a situation where a repair has already been done, um, you, you can't go to the council and ask for grant or, or financial assistance. You know, you, you can't try and use a sort of Section 55 missing shares um, those kind of uh, 
ways of, sort of dealing with things always need to be dealt with before you actually start on on a repair so in this situation i think if they really don't have the cash they are going to have to look at loans but maybe you know they could agree to kind of start paying things up with owners you know that might be something which that which their co-owners would would deal with but you know that's that's where you start and of course if people in a really very bad financial issue go and get money advice you know if 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 you can afford it go and speak to an independent financial advisor they often charge otherwise agencies like money advice scotland will help you out with free financial advice and you know if you're landlords and you're trying to deal with your co-owners who can't can't afford repairs point people in that direction so that they can get good advice on how to raise money that is suitable for their particular circumstances. Thanks, Annie. Um, right, we've got another question uh, that was submitted ahead of the webinar today. Uh, this is from Ronnie, and his question is, can you advise about the precedence of property title deeds slash burdens for repairs over the intentions of the Tenement Scotland Act 2004? Um, probably the first thing to do, Annie, is maybe is you can break that down a little bit um, and explain um, uh, what it is that Ron is specifically referring to. Um, and I know Ronnie's here today, too, so you can add stuff in the chat room as well. But uh, talk generally what about that particular issue, because it's a it is a critical one. Yeah. OK, Ronnie, if, if I've got your interpretation of this question wrong, get on the chat, please. And, and we'll we'll come back to it and, and try and, and try and deal with it as, as it comes. Um, I think what you're asking us here is if your title deed say do X and the Tenements Act says do Y, which do you do? Well, your title deeds always take precedence. So you do X, you do what your title deeds say. So if they say you will vote for things in a certain way, then you, you, you do that. If they say these repairs are common um, and the Tenements Act says something else, you always follow your title deeds. They are the things which take priority. The problem that people get is when, firstly, what's in the title deed is, is unworkable. Um, and one of the, the big unworkable things that tends to come up is the issue about repairs being dealt with by rateable value, um, because rateable values were, they were abolished in the 1980s, you know, uh, and sometimes they're called rental, assessed, assessed rental values, you know, they are totally archaic. Um, and they are based on what the flats were like you know, physically at, it, it, in the late 1980s when, when the rateable values were abolished. And since that time, you know, everything's changed. Some flats have been expanded, you know, two knocked together, some have been split up. Things are not as they were, and the rateable values is now no longer relevant. And, it, and if that's the case with you, then you go to what the Tenements Act says, which is that you divide repair costs either equally or by floor area if one flat's more than 1.5 times the size of, of the other. So if I've got this right, Ronnie, title deeds always take precedence unless they are unworkable or silent. If there's nothing in them, at which point you go to the appropriate bits of the Tenements Act and the Tenement Management Scheme. And of course, the Tenements Act did add, add in some other responsibilities responsibility one of the most important ones actually is that everyone should have common insurance adequate common insurance that was a really good thing that has been added in um, since 2004 duty to maintain that was also added i'm sure we'll come back to that one as, as we always do i think and then um, the right to appeal to to a sheriff court over over decisions that have been made you know that's really the the nub of where we are um, having answered that, I'm just going to go and have a quick look at chat and see if Ron has come back saying, no, Annie, well, I can, I can, I can Annie. summarize that for you, Annie. No, no, I'll summarize that for you, Annie, because Ronnie has come back and, uh, he was going, he's asked the question that I was going to ask actually. So, okay. <laughs> um, and he says, basically, uh, what do you do when the title deeds don't agree? So, uh, he said the title deeds for owners and landlords are the same, but the commercial property underneath the flats is demanding that as their deeds do not concur uh and as such they want to split costs by square footage okay so i think that boils down to being unworkable you know if, if the deeds don't agree if there's nothing clear uh between those deeds it's unworkable so you go to what the tenements act says so that's 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 where you are with things and um 
by square foot um it that would probably work if it you know you just just do a quick common sense check um you start to apply that where one flat is more than one and a half times the size of the other so the biggest you know is is has got two two stories to it the smallest has only got one story that's probably a, a case where you you go to working things out by floor area and and i think we've got that covered on the website haven't we jazz will tell us and pop something in on the website you know on the chat here anyway you know <laughs> Hopefully that's answered that, Ronnie. May not be to your liking. I don't know, but I hope that's answered. Eddie, what, I mean, that's it brings up an interesting point of when you've got situations where you've got a commercial property underneath you. What are what are some of the unique challenges that that owners and landlords have when dealing with uh, commercial property owners, particularly how community how commercial properties have changed over the years. I mean, when, when a lot of these title deeds yeah. were written, they were big money. They were making a lot more money than they are now. So Yeah. And, and that's why people use the, the, the rateable value um, because it, it was a way of, sort of providing some kind of equity between the kind of the assumed incomes, which owners would have, you know, like it was assumed that everyone who owned a residential property was actually a private landlord and renting it out. So the assessed rental there, um, was their income and what they could afford to pay. And there was the assessed rental for the shop. And we often assumed that the shop was actually, you know, had that higher rental value. Um, and in those days under older tenements, they did. But, you know, high streets have just declined and shops just don't have that kind of rental income coming in uh, these days. So, you know, it, it, it's something which the land tribunal has picked up on as well. You know, people have gone to them and said, look, we want to change our title deeds to make this more equitable. It's generally been supported by the land tribunal. And there was one particular case where they actually reckoned that owners didn't need to pay each other any compensation because they all benefited from having a far more workable kind of distribution of, of, of repair costs. Um, a couple of other problems which come up with shop owners, and they don't seem to be coming up here because obviously the shop owner has responded in this case. Um, the first one is actually finding out who owns the shop um, because it's, this may not be coming up in, in the general uh, registers and, and land registers, in which case you can use the Scottish assessor's role to find out who owns the shop. Um, and, and the other problem that comes up is that um, uh, people are often renting out their shops on full repairing leases. Now, this can be totally inequitable for someone who's rented a shop, finding out that they've got to pay a huge repair cost for repairing a building in which they've got no stake at all. And they may just flatly refuse. Um, but you have to go back to the shop owner there because it's the owner's responsibility to carry out common repairs and to deal with the co-owners. And if they've got some kind of deal between them and the tenant, that's up to them to enforce subsequently and separately. They shouldn't be bringing other owners in on that. So those are the kind of the three issues, really, that the rateable value, the finding out where the, you know, who owns the shop in the Scottish assessor's role, and then making sure that you deal with the owner rather than the tenant, even if there is that full repairing lease in place. Great, Annie. No, I think that, uh, and Ronnie's come back to say that it's in line with legal advice. So hooray for that. Oh, okay. And the lawyers agree. <laughs> oh, hooray. Hooray. Uh, I've got, uh, so I've got a question actually, John, I'm going to, I'm going to put, uh, bring you into the conversation here. We've had a couple of uh, stuff with Annie. Let's bring John into this. Um, John, we have a question from Louise and Jazz, while I'm, I'm talking through this, uh, is going to try to put a picture up that she submitted. Um, and um, Louise says that the issue we are having is with gutters on the extension, uh, which is highlighted below, which we'll put the picture up. The gutters are reversed and are filling with water. Uh, we obtained multiple quotes and wrote out to owners advising of these works. We advised that the costs were to be split between the flats of the two blocks uh, that are added to the extension. We received a number of objections to these works proceeding as some owners believe that the responsibility is solely with the owners of the ground floor flats. The gutters on the extension are not attached to the down pipe of the flats and the extensions were also part of the original development, not an add-on. Uh, the title deeds are silent on gutters in general. Is there anything that you can advise on in this situation? And there, John, we've got the, the picture up there. So that is the, uh, 
what she said there. We're having um, problems with the having the ext- the issues with extensions highlighted in yellow. They are reversed and filling with water. So, John, is that something that you can can talk through a bit? I know Annie can probably pop in there. The as well. extension is on the ground floor, at the rear, and uh, it's uh, it looks like it's over the two closes, basically at the back of two closes, or is it a ground floor flat which is shared between the two closes? Um, <sighs> I mean, from that yellow mark, it looks like it's uh, uh, the area is shared between the two closes. Um, and obviously, there should be a drain which goes into the common uh, main drain of the the close or one or the other. And I think there probably would have been two downpipes originally, one going through one of the closes and one going through the other one. Maybe there's only one downpipe now um I, i'm not just too clear uh where the extension is uh and how it relates to those two closes um, yeah so um, go ahead so i'm i'm just looking at this and thinking um quite often in these old older buildings there would have been a business on on the ground floor and they would often extend out the back um, sometimes, you know, these were going over the whole of the back court and were the kind of saloon back courts, as people called them. You know, sometimes they were kind of lovely pavilions, you know, fully roofed, um, where people had shops and big meeting rooms and things like that. I think this, I, I think the situation here, Louise, I, I think I might be inclined to agree with the other owners here. Um, the Tenements Act does say that. Um, any part of a building which is, or any extension specifically, which is the property of only one owner, is the responsibility of that owner. So I kind of suspect that if this, if these extensions, I mean, they're kind of joined together, aren't they? But if these are used only by the ground floor owners, then I think it's probably only those ground floor owners who are responsible for repairing um, the the gutters there and preventing damage to the rest of the building. Um, and then when it comes to dealing with the repair, then I think it's the two ground floor owners who have to act t- together. Uh, you know, this comes into being a kind of mutual repair where it's the two owners who need to agree between them what they will do and, and how they will deal with it. But if the title deeds don't say anything, I think that's probably the position where we are with it. Yes, I mean, I would have thought that the water from that gutter goes into a downpipe, which goes through one close to the front, mm. possibly, mm. Uh, and that you'd have to pay any repair to the drainage that goes through that close. Um, whereas, if it doesn't go through the other close, I don't think you'd pay for that. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think I think it's strange. You know, they. I mean, I'm not sure whether. It looks like we've got two kind of pyramid-shaped roofs from what we can see. Yes, there. it looks it's like it was two thing. individual properties and it's been made into one ownership. Yeah. But yeah. the gutter is quite long, so I would I would have thought there would have had to be two downpipes on that gutter, at least. Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. one going into the uh, close on the right and one going on, on the close on the left. Yeah, I'm also wondering though whether what Louise is thinking about is that it's actually there's the valley in between the two roofs there, John. I, I wonder if it's water going into that that Louise is referring to. If she's on the call, maybe she could jump in again. Um, I'm not sure she might be coming in to, to watch the recording, but um, if you're if, if you're there, Louise, jump in on the chat and say you know if we've got the, the appraisal of this if, of this correct and. Um, the valley would be shared between the two owners yeah. of that extension. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like the it's it's uh, sounds like from the question too that it's it might be the other owners of the the building in the back that are saying we are not responsible for this. So it might just be a question of whether that's one uh, person that's in there or there are two people in there. If there are two people in there, then it might be a question of whether that it's a mutual repair. 
Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think I'm agreeing with the other owners who are saying that this is going to be uh, the responsibility of the people who own that individual extension. Hmm. You know, that helps. Then, if this extension was built originally along with the original tenement, um, maybe it would be in the deeds. Well, I think they're saying in there, John, that there's nothing in the title deeds. Yeah, nothing, nothing in the title deeds. Yeah, which is not really surprising. No. <laughs> in some ways, yeah. So it's okay. it's back, it's back to Ronnie's question, isn't it? You know, <laughs> what takes precedence? It, it's a, it's a tenants act here, you know, because it's, it's silent, stroke, unworkable. You know? Maybe this is a good opportunity, Annie, just to briefly touch on, and John, too, to, to pop in there as well, to touch on the differences uh, between common repairs and, and mutual repairs, um, just to make that those two those two statements clear. That, I mean, there's there's a lot of sort of very specific things, of the difference between common repairs and, and mutual repairs, but maybe if you could just touch on the differences between those, what do those actually mean? Okay, well, a, a common repair, if I jump in on this, I think this is a totally legal kind of thing, isn't it? A common repair is one which is carried out to what the Tenements Act calls scheme property. So it's it's repairs to things like the roof and the walls, and very often, but not always the close, you know, the stairs, um, things which everybody has use of and everybody benefits from. You know, these are repairs which we term common repairs. Everybody has to pay for them. Mutual repairs are for things which a number of owners get the benefit from, but not everybody in, in, in that tenement. So the stairs can actually be mutual if you have ground floor, main door flats or shops which have no access to, the, to that close, you know, no access to the stairs. Uh, and if that's the case, they don't pay for painting the stairs. Um, it's just the owners that have use of it that pays that's when we call something mutual so they're both repairs where the the cost and the decisions have to be shared by a number of owners common repairs it's a hundred percent of owners mutual repairs it's just the owners that have use of them so it can be the close it can be the gutters just on one side of the building or or in this case here you know these of extensions which are joined together by you know this faulty valley gutter or or whatever where there's a mutual repair because there's there's a second case of mutual repairs and that is where you have mutual between two tenements so a gable wall that it lies between two tenements or a shared chimney head these are things where the owners on both sides of that party wall are responsible for carrying out repairs we also tend to call those mutual as, as well yes the, the mutual skew as well yeah <laughs> yeah and we've got some lovely pictures somewhere of people who've repaired half a tenement while you know half half a chimney while the other half of the chimney is, is left to, to fall down i'm not quite sure what the benefit of repairing one half the chimney is when you yes. just leave over and it's, fall through the other smooth. room however these situations happen <laughs> John, is, do you have anything that you wanted to add on that from your? No, experience? it's it's mutual chimneys are the biggest problem because you have to get uh, agreement with all the tenement owners on both sides, um, and um, they, that can be problematic because there's so many owners. Um, but uh, you really want to rebuild a defective chimney head on both sides not just on one side you know so it's worth doing if you if you're bothering to do it um great well this seems like a good opportunity we'll take a to take a short comfort break um opportunity for you to refresh your tea or uh any other things that you need to attend to uh, over a five minute period um we're going to play a short video uh while we're taking that comfort break um from a previous event that we held to have a little bit of information for people who don't need to get up or just have it playing in the background um and then we're going to come back uh we'll take more questions um we haven't had much in uh as far as questions today so we encourage you if you have questions this is an excellent opportunity to get one in um and we will well, we've certainly got plenty more that we can discuss. Um, but if you've got some questions you would like to ask, um, please send them over. Uh, we still got a couple more from that were pre-submitted. And when we come back too, we'll also bring in um, someone who had submitted a question. Uh, Stuart, he's going to join us 
on the call here uh, live and ask his uh, his question as well. So um, we'll see you back in about five minutes. Thanks very much. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name's Rory, I'm the Private Sector Landlord Advisor for uh, Home Energy Scotland South East. Uh, today I'll be giving you a bit of an introduction to who Home Energy Scotland are uh, and the range of support and advice that we can offer to landlords and letting agents about improving the energy efficiency in your rental properties. So to start off with, uh, I'm just gonna give you a quick overview of, of who Home Energy Scotland are. We are a free and impartial advice service offering energy efficiency advice to a range of different customers. Uh, and this can cover things like transport or, or renewable technologies or just general tips around the home to reduce energy consumption. Um, we do offer a specialist landlord service uh, and that's part of the service that I deliver. Now we offer this service uh, across the country through several different regional centres. Uh, I'm talking to you today from my spare room in Edinburgh uh, and I'm responsible for advising landlords in the southeast of Scotland. Uh, if you do have properties uh, around the rest of the country however we're still able to offer the same level of service uh, it just won't necessarily be myself that you'd be speaking to directly. So our aims really are to help reduce uh, Scotland's carbon emissions from domestic properties and as well to help tackle fuel poverty uh, and reduce fuel bills. Uh, in doing so we speak to around 90,000 households each year uh, and this is primarily remotely over the phone uh, on the 0808 number shown on this slide uh, and throughout where we offer a remote advice centre. In terms of the support that we're able to offer to landlords though this includes remote support over the phone uh, and by email, as well as conducting uh, energy performance certificate EPC reviews. So if you have a larger rental portfolio and some properties are of concern, that's something that I can help out with and that's generally conducted over email. We do offer a free home visit service uh, and this can be both a, a physical visit uh, and a virtual visit. Um, and we are the gateway for different forms of funding support from the Scottish Government. Uh, and I'll come on to talk about each of these measures very shortly. Just to give you an idea before we start of, of the type of advice that we can offer, this can include things around if you're considering upgrading electric heating from panel heaters to storage heaters or to more modern storage heaters potentially, as well as if you're considering upgrading condensing uh, to condensing gas boilers from an older model. Uh, and we do also offer advice on renewable technologies as well, such as heat pumps. As well as this, we can help you consider your options for insulation, uh, as well as measures like double glazing, uh, draft proofing, uh, and, and also a bit of detail into the different options you may have for different types of insulation. As you may be aware already, uh, in the rental sector, the Scottish Government has proposed to introduce minimum energy efficiency standards, which stipulate that a property must be at a minimum uh, energy performance certificate banding in order to be rented out. Um, this is something that the government initially talked about introducing in 2019 um, to come into effect in March 2020. Now those dates have been progressively put back um, largely due to coronavirus. Um, we do now know as of uh, a couple of weeks ago from the government's heat and building strategy what the new minimum standards are going to look like and they're summarized on the table on this slide. So essentially this is going to stipulate from 2025 on a change of tenant each rental property will need to be a band C or above and this will then come into effect for all rental properties from 2028. In terms of the advice we're able to offer then and thinking about the ways that we do this, first of which is often remotely uh, and this is often where you would call the 0808 number shown on screen, initially talk to my colleagues uh, and then potentially be, be th put through to me directly and during these conversations we can talk about what types of, of insulation, what heating types may be suitable for your properties, 
give you an idea of the potential costs involved in this, Directly, as well as the practical uh, side of conversations, we can talk might about be involved what types in of these measures. Um, particularly important, of course, if your tenants are sorry, if your properties are already tenanted. All of this then has a view to what impact this may have on your energy performance certificate, uh, and we can of course walk through existing EPCs if you have those already but you can contact us on the 0808 number shown on screen. Uh, you can also email me directly at rory.hill at se.homeenergyscotland.org. Thank you. And welcome back. Uh, hope you enjoyed that uh, short video from Rory. We've uh, been doing a number of energy efficiency uh, webinars, both with uh, the one earlier uh, this month, uh, we focused on energy efficiency. Um, and also, uh, we did a series of, of webinars uh, back in September as part of the Doors Open Days. Um, and those uh, <laughs> focused on Aberdeen, Glasgow, and Edinburgh. Each one of them were a little bit different, and each one of them um, talked about different projects that, that are underway, as, um, as well as as far as energy efficiency, but also uh, brought in people from Home Energy Scotland as well. So um, we'd encourage you, you can find all of those on our YouTube page um, and Jazz will put those up. Uh, also, if you, you can also use the Big Marker uh, website um, platform as well to find those, uh, to find out more information on it. Right, um, I think we're gonna try to bring in Stuart here. Uh, so if we could do that, uh, I see he's online. Uh, hello, Stuart, can you hear us? Yes. Hi. Good afternoon. Hi, sir. You Thanks for joining us. Uh, would you like to ask your question? Oh, oh just in time. Here comes uh, technology. I, I have it here now. There we are, sir. <laughs> I've got a, I'm a landlord for a top floor middle uh, flat uh, in a tenement block. We've been having trouble with the roof uh, leaking, and we've now eventually got some contractors round. Um, been they're giving us quotes. Uh, now, I contacted all the residents and the landlords. Uh, so it's nine nine flats and two properties. Uh, the contractors have said that they'll only deal financially with me. And then it's up to me to obviously recuperate the money from the rest of the tenements. The title deeds do say that any repairs to the roof are common. They should be shared, basically, you know, among all the, the owners. The problem I have is, since we started talking about actually proceeding with it, a lot of the owners are going quiet. No response to emails. And I know at least two of them do live abroad. So my question is, how do I ensure that everybody pays their full share? How serious are these roof repairs, Stuart? Uh, the top three flats are getting damaged to the roof in heavy weather. You can actually see daylight through the skew between the roof and the wall. Uh, okay. And it's now also affecting the flats on the middle floor they're getting dampness through their walls and we're also seeing flooding during heavy rains in the cellar. So it's, it's affecting right through the whole building. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I'll just start off with the kind of the enforcing repairs bit of this, first of all, um, and ask you a few questions on that. And then maybe John could chip in with some thoughts about going about roof repairs here, although your contractors are probably on the ball here with this. So, um, just say again, you, you had nine owners, you say? There's, n there's nine flats, three floors with three flats on each, and then there's two commercial properties on the ground floor. Okay, so you've got 11 owners. 11 in total, together. yes. Right. And what do your title deeds say about making decisions, if any? Uh, there's basically just a one-liner that says that any repairs to the roof are communal between all uh, owners of the block. Okay, which means that you need to get a majority of owners to agree if you're going to carry this out in a standard kind of way. But I suspect yeah. that with the extent of repairs you're talking about, you might be able to use the duty to maintain uh, to deal with this. Let's come back to that and let's deal with this question about the majority of owners, first of all, because as we say, it's always best to try and do things in a cooperative kind of way. So. Yeah. Yeah. You've been in touch with all of these owners. Are you pretty yeah. certain that you have actually got their addresses and that you are getting through to them? The, yes, the, um, it's actually the, the, the person next door, he's, he had everyone's email address. Once this started, 
We sent an email around everyone. Everyone replied basically saying, yes, go and get quotes. Thanks for taking the lead on this. And then when I started responding to everyone saying, got quotes, here's what we're looking at. Can you respond to say that you're you happy to go ahead and you'll honour your payment? And yeah, maybe just, about, just over half have responded to say, yeah, I'm quite happy with that. It needs doing, go ahead. Okay, so you've got agreement of a majority to actually go ahead and carry out the repairs. Okay. Now, is a majority just more than fifty percent? Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. Which you, which you know, in a situation where you've got an unequal number of flats, is easy. Uh, the mm. problem can be when you've got an equal number of flats, and it, it becomes fifty-fifty. And sadly, in that case, that becomes a vote for inaction. And I've I've always said, a number of colleagues have said, you know, if it's a fifty-fifty split, it ought to be a vote for action, you know, for getting repairs done. But it's not. One of the many things that could be improved is the tenement repair situation, I yeah. think. So so basically, uh, you're in a position where you've got a majority of owners to agree, the minority of owners need to go along with this. Okay. Now, it may be that you're going to need to use a council's missing shares. Um, you're in Aberdeen? Yes, not, Aberdeen City. Do they do missing shares? I'm not sure. I haven't, I haven't taken any advice from the council yet. It was just this opportunity came up and I thought I'll speak to yeah. you guys first. Yeah, okay. Um, Aberdeen may well offer a, a missing shares a solution to things. A large number of local authorities do because they're such a good way of getting things done. So missing shares um, comes into place. It's part of the Housing Scotland Act of 2006, I think it is. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a provision whereby local authorities can jump in and help where you have owners who can't or won't carry out common repairs. And you have to go through all the correct procedures and you have to get the local authorities' agreement before you start on this. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the local authority will tell you what the procedures are. We also have them down on, on, the, on, on the website. But basically, it's just about making sure that you've gone through and got all the written authorities that you need and you've given people all the details that they need. Uh, and, and the local authority will agree that if someone can't or won't pay, they will pay their share. That's why it's called the missing share. Okay. And, um, and when they're in that situation, the council agrees to pick up the missing share. The council will write to the owners and say, right, we will pay the bit if, if you don't pay, but we will charge you 8% interest and we will charge you an admin fee of X hundred pounds. And all of a sudden people find that they can raise the money because it's far more expensive to go yes. through using the local authority on, on, on the missing shares. So I think what you should do next is just, um, well, first of all, tell all the owners, um, particularly those who haven't yet got back to you, that you now have a majority of repairs, a, a majority of owners to agree, which means that you will proceed. Um, and ask for them to come back and agree that they will pay you the money when the time comes. And if possible, get to pay it in advance, Stuart. So that, that, that was my preference, was to actually get the money in advance. Yeah. We're, talking, we're talking around about £6,000 here. Um, yeah. So my, 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 my plan was to try and get everyone to pay in advance of their share. They've got a copy of the quote, you know, and then I'll, I'll just I'll deal with the admin with the contractor. You know what, Stuart, the ideal thing for you to do in this situation would be to see if you could set up a common repairs account for the problem. Okay. Um, now, uh, banks call this a treasurer's account. Um, sometimes they can be a bit difficult to find a bank who will do it and then to go through the whole of the, the money laundering procedures. Try mm. starting off with your own bank or if, if you've got the other owner working with you, if you both use the same bank, that will definitely help to try and get things set up. It can yeah. be a bit long-winded. But, you know, for the future, if you are going to be sort of self-factoring, mm. arranging repairs yourself, it's by far yeah. the best way. Because then all the co-owners can pay the money into that account, knowing that it's going to need the signature of at least two or three of you for, for that money to be taken out and spent yeah. in, the, in the appropriate way. And yeah. that's, all, yeah. that's all going to protect you in case one of the other owners won't pay up. Yeah. And, we, we did have a factor for about a year. Um, but then what we were finding with the factor was that they wouldn't touch anything, um, like any major uh, troubles that went wrong. So we didn't really know what we were paying for, apart from mm -hmm. oh, give us a call and we'll contact a plumber in an emergency or a joiner in an emergency. So 
we, we came away from that contract and ever since it's just been sort of literally between the tenants. Yeah, uh, okay. I mean, I think, I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with self-factoring. I mean, I think the worst thing is no factoring, nobody getting involved in taking mm. responsibility for things. But when you're self-factoring, you do start to take quite a lot on yourself. And here you are in one of those situations where, where you might be the one who's having to, to pay for, for that repair and then get all, all the cash back from the other owners. And if there's a problem with, with the work being carried out, you're going to be the one that has to, has to deal with it. Yeah. it, it we generally think it's you know factors can take a lot off you in that sense and you can get some very good factors and if yours is rubbish then have a word with them change them yeah. you know, but it's you do want a proper factoring system in place and if you're going to do it yourself then you know i think you do want to have that that common repairs account i think that would certainly help yeah. um and it, it's interesting the point you're making here about you being the one who the you know the tradesman will only deal with you we've actually got another question in in, in the q a on a very similar kind of thing um and and this is it's yet another one of these things about tenement legislation that we really want to change you know is is that even if you are a group of owners you're an owners association you are not a legal entity and you can all all be pursued jointly or or severally for every single repair debt that comes up and the good tradesmen who, who do a lot of work in tenements know this. You know, they're not going to go running around trying to get the money from nine individual, eleven individual owners. In, yeah. in your case. I mean, life is just too short. They won't do your repair, you know, yeah. unless they know that one person is is going to pay up for something. And that was basically the reason they gave was that they've been stung in the past yeah. and won't deal with uh, multiple owners. Yeah, yeah. So you know, I mean, this is where. You know, it does fall down to one owner having to deal with things if, if you don't have a factor who, who, who will pick things up. And you want to give yourself as much protection as possible in that situation. You know, the common the common repairs account, people paying it in advance. But, yeah, it, it's absolutely the situation. And, and it's one of the things that we're trying to get changed um, in, in the legislation is to have owners associations, which are corporate identities, which means that, you know, the group pays for things and, and and it goes against the group as a whole you can't pick off individual owners and make them responsible for the whole of, of a, a repair in, in a building so uh, that that's what you should do in your particular situation um i would just say if anybody else out there is in a similar situation but maybe just slightly different i think it sounds as if the the position or the the lack of repair to the roof is such that if Stuart hadn't been able to get a majority of owners to agree to that repair, he could have used the duty to maintain. Uh, and I spoke about that in a previous question. And, and the duty to maintain is something which says that one owner can step in and carry out all the required repairs if there is that need for that essential maintenance. Uh, it only applies to actually patching a repair. I mean, you can't go and totally refurbish a tenement using the duty to maintain. You probably wish you could sometimes, but you can't. You can only do what's essential, and that may be kind of patching repairs. But that is another alternative that people can use if they can't get majority agreement of owners, and they are in the kind of situation where the repairs are so bad, as Stuart has, has described. John, do you want to jump in on something here? Uh, yeah, I was ask, I'm going to ask Stuart if he had... Uh, how many quotes did you have for the work? Hey, I've, got, I've managed to get two quotes. Two. The, prob the problem we have is the minute you say it's a tenement building, a lot of contractors don't want to know. So, and did all the quotes uh, include scaffolding or yes. power? Yes, incl they include scaffolding. Okay, so the contractor would have a safety policy because you, you would be responsible for the safety of anybody on the roof. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, it'd, it'd be better, obviously, if you had three quotes. Um, yeah, but, but that, that, that's that's a problem we have, and it's actually what's local here when you speak to other uh, landowners or sorry, um, owners of tenements. Is I actually contacted fifteen roofing companies in the city, and three get back to me. When one said it was, I said it was a three-story high tenement. He didn't want to know, so the other two were the only two that would actually quote for the job. Uh -huh. uh, and I have said this in previous emails to all the. Uh, the owners, um, all the landlords, 
Okay, so that's the best you can do. So yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, I think that it, that is often a problem with with tradespeople is that you know there's a lot of demand for, for their work. They can pick and choose, and and they're going to start picking and choosing, you know, by how easy it is going to be to to recover their costs, and also just sort of sometimes you know you're asking people for a quote. Actually, what you're asking them for is to go out and do a survey of your roof and, and tell them what's you know, yeah. get them to tell you what's wrong. Um, and sometimes you will do much better if if you get a surveyor to come in first of all and have a look at things and and give you a really good specification for what needs done um and sometimes you know although that seems expensive well first of all think about it this way Stuart you're not paying a factor's fee so you could afford to use some of that money to pay for a surveyor to come up and, and do a good job for you and also, you know, a surveyor might pick up other things that need done. I mean, scaffolding is a huge part of the cost of carrying. Oh out. yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's nearly half the cost. Half the quote is is uh, scaffolding. Yeah. I mean, I think the other thing is the surveyor would probably have some contacts with tradespeople, uh, and he might ad advise you on who he, he mm -hmm. go to go to. And actually, having a surveyor might encourage any contractor to quote for it as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I think, you know, a couple of other situations here about about roof repairs is, is that firstly, you know, if you if you've got um, trade people coming in to give you quotes for something, they know that if you've not got a surveyor involved, you're probably just going to go for the cheapest, you know, because everyone told that's what you do, pick the cheapest. So what they will do is tend to give you, you know, a quote for kind of a patch repair. Now, we all know it's also unplanned repairs are the most expensive you know half that cost is putting scaffolding up you know if you could spend another couple of thousand pounds and avoid having to put scaffolding up again in the next five years it would be good value to actually mm -hmm. go ahead and spend that bit more john i can see you jumping yeah. in yeah <laughs> well i think if you had a surveyor's report that would uh come wait it help you uh convince other owners that it was the work was necessary Mm -hmm. um, so it was an independent report on the roof and saying what it was required and that would help you convince others i mean might not convince everybody but it would certainly help yeah no that's, that's, that's great advice actually that was it was an approach i never thought yeah okay so, uh, no that's that's great thanks for that well hopefully we've dealt with all of that Stuart. i mean it's a good question because although it's a really common one yeah. You know, we keep dealing with it. And I sometimes think, oh, gosh, maybe we've not used the right words on the website for people to go and search for all the information we've got there. You know, once we start talking to people, we can actually give you an awful lot more advice about good management that is going to go just beyond that we question about how do I deal with those four owners who, who, who won't reply to us. So yeah. thank you very much for that. Thanks, question. Stuart. No, thanks very much for your advice. Much appreciated. Well, and... Um... So one uh, is sort of staying on the topic from another question, and this is uh, from Ronnie. He said, are there any other options for roof repairs other than using scaffolding? Uh, in other words, is, uh, maybe, John, you could talk a little bit about experience of using ladders or rope access. Uh, Ronnie asks, or is that all driven by height uh, and health and safety? Uh, I've been told that roofing companies can do one thing for a single owner or a landlord, but need to work differently for multiple owners and tenements. Uh, I think the only where you could not use scaffolding is if it was repair to a chimney or something like that and you might use uh, a crane you know or a telescopic uh, 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 arm that would reach the height and you could safely get out the chimney head um, even some gutters possibly if you were do, doing the front gutter but it would only be in the front because you couldn't get access around the back probably um rope access is really only useful for stone pointing and minor repairs on stonework um so it, it's really not very useful on on the roof um but some people have used it if they're going around cleaning the gutters haven't they john you know they use a uh, rope pack yes, yes. Of cradle that they put over the sort of uh, the peak of the roof yes uh, and and they take ropes off off that you know yeah, but yeah. I, I think there's i don't think people can do huge amounts of work there i mean you can do minor minor works 
clearing the gutters and things like that. But you can just imagine yourself, you know, you, you cannot deal with huge chunks of stone dangling off the end of a piece of rope. You know, you are going to have to yeah. scaffold yeah. for substantial repairs, but for minor repairs. Interesting thing, actually, um, if you've got a very low level tenement, you know, like three small stories in a kind of more modern building, people actually use things like giant vacuum cleaners, you know, and power washers now to, to clean out the, the gutters in, in these these low rise buildings. So that that is an alternative for the for, for, for gutter cleaning on sort of lower buildings. Oh, Mike, we can't another, uh, we've got plenty of questions, actually, um, and we and continue to keep them coming. I should note that if we don't get to your question today, please send through um, a uh, us an email at info at under one roof dot Scott. Just basically just send your question that you'd sent on in the in the uh, chat room. Um, send it on uh, to info at under one roof dot Scott. Uh, Jazz will put that email address in. Uh, and if we don't get to it today, we will get to it in the uh, the next week or so uh, and get back to you with an answer to it. But uh, Ian's got a question. I own one of the top flats at a property in Aberdeen where there is a leak into the communal stairwell. Uh, the factors have advised that they have had a contractor around to investigate. And the leak is due to a problem with the dormer window of my flat that overlaps the stairwell. Now, there is no evidence of a leak into my flat either on the ceiling or the wall, but the factors are insisting that I need to resolve the leak at my cost as the dormer window of the roof is not a communal, res communal responsibility under the Tenements Act. I would seek clarification on the issue of responsibility in these circumstances as I was under the impression that any issues related to the roof on tenement building is a shared responsibility. Yeah, the door windows has always been a bit of a tough one. Um, and it's something that isn't specifically specified in the um, in the Tenements Act. So some people do say, look, it's an extension that's used by only one person there. Therefore, it's individual. Um, I, th I, th I think that we probably all agree now that dormer windows, um, problems with them are a common repair. Um, obviously not the windows themselves but the cheeks and the roof over the um of, of the dormer window I, I think we generally accept now are common repairs and that was probably by intent of the act and there was some discussion when the law commission were were deciding on these things about dormer windows that would bring them into that that situation um but it does sound a bit unusual that it's going over the common stairs yes, that is unusual i don't understand that mm. Maybe if you could send us a picture, Ian. And um, I believe know. we do have a picture. So oh, what I'll do is, uh, oh, yes, I'm not sure if Jazz has got it to hand, though. So um, what we'll do is we'll move on to another quote. Here it comes. There it goes. There's the picture. Boomer's sure been added. Yeah, yeah. Does it say it was added, although it was there? Oh, you can look. You can see it. <laughs> it was been added since that tenement was built. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, right. So... Yeah. Um, They're flashing probably at the base of the slate there, which may be letting water in to the top of the close. Mm. Um, it's a difficult one. Um, yeah. Certainly. It, it's behind the, the gutter, it's probably set back a bit and hiding a bit behind, isn't it? So we can't see it exactly. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Well, I, 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 yeah, I mean, if, if the roof is common, yes, but this dormer has been up, installed, you know, recently or relatively recently over the last 50 years, probably. Um, so a lot of dormers have been installed quite recently, you know, so... Uh, it, it, it's it's a big grey area and and no doubt people did this and extended into the roof and at the time they didn't agree with other owners or change the title yeah. deed to sort out these problems and it was probably the owners before ian you know so yeah. um i mean i i think this this might be one that we would want to just come back on and clarify i i suspect that this could well be a common repair but why do we come back on on this one at some point, Mike, and just go and check check this one out and just come back with some kind of 
greater clarification. On Great. Well, we've got Ian's uh, email. He was kind enough to, to send in his question ahead of time. So what we'll do is we'll take that one offline and we'll get back to Ian. Uh, if I don't believe Ian is actually in today or in at the moment, but um, if he is, um, uh, you're welcome to pop through some more information. But we've we're, we've hit one o'clock, but I think what we'll do is we'll try to see if we can get through a couple more. If that's okay with everybody, can stick around. Quick we, I would encourage you again, just to drop an email to info at under one roof. Uh, dot Scott and uh, with your question and we will get to it. We don't have a question and answer uh, session scheduled for December because that would fall usually it falls at the end of the month and that will be, of course, holiday time. Um, but uh, we'll have another one in January. Um, I've got a question, a quick one from Abigail Intercom. Question about the intercom. Do ground floor properties need to pay for intercom repairs? Quick answer. Do they use it? OK, because if they do, then they do. You know, it, this is coming back to the, you know, the thing about common or individual repairs that we talked about earlier. If they have use of it, they pay for it. You know, if, if, if they don't use it, then I think it should be the other owners who pay for it as that kind of mutual repair. Great. We'll just quickly move on to the next one. Um, Ian has a question again about roofing. Uh, another question about roofing. Some costs, uh, re example being roofing, are, are very prohibitive, uh, unfordable by some owners. Is there any way of tenement owners incorporating and attracting public funding as, say, a housing ASC? If all housing people. Association, yeah. I don't think housing associations do get uh, public funding for carrying out repairs. Yeah. Um, they, they will get some funding for, for building properties. Um, they will also get a lot of private sector funding for building properties, which they repay back that funding through the rents. But, you know, housing associations are obliged to actually make financial plans um, and to have reserves to help them cover this situation. So they aren't they aren't getting that public funding. Some local authorities probably hardly any give grants these days, um, you know, and I suppose in some ways we should be asking ourselves, you know, if owners are going to get the benefit of, of having, you know, their roofs repaired, should they be getting public funding for it? I'm, I'm not sure. But, but, you know, I think we may have to come to that at some point just to deal with this huge backlog of repairs because it's having implications for energy efficiency as well. But, you know, I think the long term answer is that people should start saving. You know, we should have these sort of uh, building reserve funds. But that's us going on again. And my one of my favorite hobby horses, uh, Mike, oh. crashing with another question quickly. I think. Quick question uh, from Pauline: Do you have advice for dealing with costs of shared repairs? We had water ingress in a tenement building, but the letting agent who highlighted the issue said that they were not willing to put their name against the invoice and then reclaim the cost from all the owners as they did not want to be out of pocket. I understand this concern completely, but also appreciate that any trades doing work would also not want to split bills seven ways, several ways. Yeah. So, I mean, this is part of the thing that we picked up when we were talking with, with Stuart about having, you know, if, if you are self-factoring, then you do really need to have a common repairs account um, and you need to, to get one of those set up. Otherwise, it is going to be a question of one owner, you know, copying the bill for, for everybody and then trying to deal with it subsequently. So, yeah, refer you back to the answer we had with Stuart on that one, I think. Any more, Mike? Uh We've got, yeah, we do have a few more. Anne's got a couple of detailed questions. What I'm going to do is ask Anne just to send us an email um, and uh, so we can contact her so we can give us a little bit more detail to her questions, but we'll get back to those quick. Um, as far as a, uh, just a last quick one, uh, let's see if we can do a real quick one. Um, well, we've got one from, let's see here, uh, from... Someone at D Street and it says, hi, one of the top floor owners has installed their gas boiler in the loft above their flat. The, go the boiler flue goes through the slate roof and is now leaking water. The flat owner is asking for remaining owners to pay towards the repair. Is that right? And should the boiler be actually be situated in the loft space? Mm -hmm. It all sounds a bit irregular. Yeah, it? no, it, it's it, not. I think if they created that hole it's a bit much for them to go back and ask all the other owners. Yeah, but, I mean, they haven't, uh, they, can't, they can't do this. <laughs> it's illegal. <laughs> <laughs> to boot. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
I, th I and I think again, you know, refer you back to our, our conversation with Stuart about surveyors ha having a look at things because, you know, is the leak actually coming from that hole, you know, or is the roof shot and there are problems all the way over? Um, you know, it's, it's another of these situations where, you know, things sound fairly unregulated and people have been, you know, ignoring problems and doing silly things like putting boilers in the roof when they shouldn't, you know, so, yeah. Great. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll call it on that for today. There's a few people that didn't get their questions answered. I apologize for us not getting to them. Um, but again, please send through your, your comments. We will get them uh, answered. Just uh, a quick note, uh, a quick programming note uh, for what we've got coming up. We have our next webinar is going to take place um, Tuesday, uh, December 14th uh, from, at 12 o'clock. So another Tuesday at noon. I think we're going to move probably all of our webinars to, to this time. Actually, they seem to be getting... A little bit more take up of people can uh, take part during the day at work um, or from home. Um, our next webinar is going to be about structural alterations. Uh, now, structural alterations can be a source of stress and tension for owners, and getting consent to carry out structural works can be a lengthy process, uh, especially if some owners do not live in the property. So, you can join this webinar um, to learn more about how to get consent from owners. What to do if your property is affected by structural works that you did not consent to and other issues just generally about making structural alterations to a tenement buildings john's going to be joining us hopefully uh and will have the opportunity to to pop in as well i'll be here as well as jazz uh who's done just an excellent job in the background for us today uh so i wanted to uh thank all of our presenters uh john and annie for joining us today great okay and, and, and uh, um, I just hope we can get back to Anne on her questions. And yes. maybe one of these we should actually be picking up in, in January as well, because sometimes there's such good points to come out of them, just like they were out of Stuart's question earlier. You know, that it's it could be worth sharing these anyway. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, 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 we'll see what we can do is we can if we respond back to Anne, we can also ask that we might take it up as a question in our uh, January uh, webinar series because uh, after uh, after the uh, um, holidays we have a webinar on the 11th on how to use the first tier tribunal um, using worked examples from past cases and we'll have some experts in on that and then we'll have our next question and answer period uh, question and answer webinar uh, will take place um, I believe the last Tuesday in uh, the last Tuesday in January, and that'll take place on the 25th. So thanks all for attending. Thanks very much for all of your questions. Sorry for those we couldn't get to. And uh, hopefully we'll see you in a couple weeks time uh, for the Structural Alterations webinar. Have a great yeah. afternoon. Yeah, thanks, everyone. We always enjoy these. Keep us on our toes. <laughs> Bye now.